Tonight's message is from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, 10, and 11. Romans, chapter 10, verses 9, 10, and 11. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. May God bless the reading and hearing of his blessed word. In this section, the, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, gives us the two requirements for receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior and for salvation. So the first is, if you shall confess with the mouth that the Lord, that the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, there are a few words here which are um, very important, which need clarification and um, exposition. And those words are Lord and Jesus. Now, here it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, that is what this uh, sentence means. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your personal Lord, this is, beloved, a personal confession. It's not just corporate. It can be done corporately, but it has to be a personal decision. So this is a result of a personal decision within the heart. Uh, and the, the confession that has to be made here is that Jesus is your Lord. Jesus Christ, Son of God, I receive you as my Lord. So that will be how this confession will go in reality when you confess it. So this is how we are supposed to confess it. Now, what does the word Lord mean? Okay, uh, let me go to the meaning of Jesus first. Uh, we are all quite familiar with the name of Jesus, but do we really know what it means? It's the Hebrew word Yeshua. Uh, and Jesus is taken from the Greek Jesus or Yesu. Uh, but in the original Hebrew, it was Yeshua. In fact, the name of Joshua in the Old Testament is similar to that of Jesus, Yeshua. And the word means Jehovah is salvation the lord the lord jehovah is salvation that is what it means so the name of our lord jesus means jehovah is salvation the great i am is the salvation and so when you declare when you confess with your mouth when you witness to who God is. When you uh, declare with your mouth, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus, Jehovah is salvation, Jesus, which means Savior in other terms, is your Lord, that the only Savior that God the Father has given for all of humanity to save us from our sins, because the problem of humanity is not bad politics. The problem of humanity is not just bad morals. The problem of humanity is not just uh, a bit of an inclination towards violence and sexual immorality. The human problem, and all of these are symptoms of that deep-rooted problem, which is diagnosed by the Bible itself, and it is called the three-letter word sin, S-I-M. Many preachers around the world will not preach on this word anymore. They are scared of offending people. They don't want their congregation to be offended because when they bring up the word sin, it brings condemnation, so they think. But the word of God talks about sin again and again and again, beloved. Because that is the root cause of all the problems of humanity. Not just political, not just relational, not just moral, but it is an eternal problem because the wages of sin according to Romans chapter 6 verse 23 if you go a few chapters back in the book of Romans you'll find in chapter 6 verse 23 it gives us this truth it says for the wages of sin is death 
If a person is a sinner and continues to commit sin in his life, then that person is going to get the wages of his sin, which is death. And the death talked about in this scripture, in this verse, Romans 6.23, is not just a physical death. Because both saint and sinner will all die physically. The death being referred to here in Romans 6.23 is eternal condemnation in the Hades or the place of the sinners. Hell, in other words, H-E-L-L. It's called Hades in the, in the Greek and it's called Sheol in the Hebrew. We are all quite familiar with the word hell, right? And so the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, in the same verse it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the blessed gospel. So there is only one way to God the Father. It is through his son, Jesus Christ, because God has given us no other name. God has given us no other person to rely upon whereby we must be saved except his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, Peter emphatically proclaims that there is no name given under heaven whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus makes this absolute claim. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And therefore, pluralism or many religions leading to the same God is alive from the pits of hell. Beloved, many preachers will not be able to tell you that truth anymore. But that is what the Bible teaches us. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. We need bold men of women, women and men and women of God to tell us the truth of the gospel without diluting it, without uh, watering it down to meet the needs of the people. Because the needs of the people is truth. And only the truth of God's, the truth of God's word can set us free from the lies of hell and the clutches of sin. Now, that if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Why does it say that we have to confess Jesus as our Lord? We'll come to the next word, Lord. The you, word used Lord here is kurios in the Greek. Now, to the Greek speakers, kurios was a word that was so familiar in the time that the New Testament was being written. Because the New Testament was written in the Greek language. It was the lingua franca of uh, Jesus' time. And in the, you know centuries that followed after that the lingua franca of our day is english but in those days it was greek and so when uh, you know paul uses the word lord he doesn't need to give an explanation of the word because it was familiar to the uh, you know listeners and his audience of that time they knew perfectly well what the significance of the word lord meant or the word kurios in the greek now, the word kurios was used for the head of a family. And we know, in, especially in olden days, in the Old Testament times, that a man would have more than one wife. He would have concubines as well. He would have men servants and women servants. He would have cattle and livestock. And uh, he would have large portions of land. And, uh, you know, uh, we have biblical examples of such men uh, in Job, in Abraham. And so they, they were the kurios of their family. And that's why Sarah referred to Abraham as my Lord. That is the word kurios in the Greek. Okay. Now, what, what does the word Lord signify? The word Lord signifies that once you declare Jesus, once you accept Jesus, the savior of the world, the only savior of the hum, human race as your Lord, you are negating any other influence over your life as the primary influence we are influenced by so many things and so many people right people are influenced by money and once they start worshiping money when making money is the primary goal of their life it takes over every other priority every relationship is determined by the pursuit of money and so greed 
takes over that person's life. And that's why in Ephesians it says, the one who is covetous is an idolater. Okay? So covetousness, which means coveting after money. Greed for money is equal to idol worship. And we know no idol leader is going to go into the kingdom of heaven. Now it, it says here, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, because there's only one Lord. Again, the definite article, the, has been used here. It's not a Lord. It's not a Lord. Okay, so Jesus is not just another Lord. He is the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 following up to verse 11 of that chapter tells us quite explicitly that Jesus is being given the name above every other name, that every knee must bow before him and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Beloved, that is the place that God, the Father, the creator of the universe has given to his only begotten son because he gave his life for humanity. He obeyed his father even until death. And he left the glories of heaven and came down to earth to be a man and gave the ultimate price for your and my salvation. There is no other name in under, under heaven whereby you and I can be justified, saved, except the name of Jesus. Because he is the only one who paid the price for our sins. And the wages of our sins is death, right? Did Jesus die on the cross? Exactly. He left his spirit. He died the way humans die. He paid the ultimate price. But you know what the gospel is? Jesus did not only pay for our sins on that, on that cross, on that rugged cross, but he was buried like every human being is buried. And on the third day, his physical body, his spirit came back into his body and his body was resurrected, a glorified body, never ever to die again. And he declares this emphatic truth in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where he says, I died and now I live, never to die anymore. Jesus is resurrected and Lord. And because he died for our sins, and because he's resurrected, now he is exalted, and he has been given the name above every other name in heaven and on earth and under the earth by God the Father. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Beloved, you and I have two choices. You can either proclaim and profess and confess Jesus as your Lord now, and be saved, or one day you will have to confess it anyway. Because there's coming a time when God says enough. And the time of preaching the gospel, the time of grace will be shut, like in the days of Noah. For a hundred years, the, uh, you know, the Lord gave him a commandment to construct that ship. He gave him the specific dimensions. And how many, you know, uh, stories would be in that ship? Three. And what material he would have to use outside and inside and the length and the breadth and the height of that ship. And for 100 years, he started at the age of 500 and then he finished the ship at the age of 600 years. And for 100 years, he was constructing that ship. He was preaching because he was not silent. The New Testament makes it very clear that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and yet the generation in his time would not listen to the message. If they only believed, if they only repented of that sin and would turn to the Lord like Noah believed in him, they would have been saved, right? But Jesus says that the coming of the day of uh, the return of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. And once again, there will be preachers of righteousness, but the majority of the world will not listen to him. But there's coming a time, beloved, and this is a warning for us, when the Lord will shut the door of salvation, like he did Noah's ark. See, it was not Noah that closed the door of the ark. It was the Lord. You can go back to the book of Genesis chapter 9, and you'll find that truth there. It was God that shut the door. In the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, God gives us 
that warning. It says, Un unless you're like the five virgins that are prepared for the return of the bride, Jesus Christ, for the bridegroom, who's coming back for his bride, the church, the true church of Christ, that has set him themselves apart from the sins of the world and have sanctified themselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to be left behind like the five foolish virgins. And they all came back, right? They came back after they went looking for the oil. And they came back with their lamps and they said, Lord, open the door for us as well. And he said, verily I say unto you, I, knew, I know you not. Beloved, those words are going to be so harsh. And the only way for those uh, saints who are left behind after that will be through martyrdom. And therefore, we have a choice to either accept Jesus as the Lord of our life, which means he will govern every aspect of our lives. And I mean every aspect, literally. The spouse you choose, everything under his per perfect will. Are you willing to make that decision? Are you willing to sacrifice all of your life to Jesus so that he takes over your life completely? Because that is what is required here. See, it's not just like um, somebody just flippantly saying without really meaning it that Jesus is my Lord and not really meaning it. And that's why I'm going to such depths to explain to you what this confession truly means. What is the import of this verse? It's not just flippantly saying that Jesus is my Lord and you'll be saved and go to heaven. No, no, that is not what it means. You have to understand what it means. You have to fully appreciate the implications of accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life because he wants complete control of your life. And he's not forcing his will on you. No, he wants you to make the decision. Because in heaven, he is Lord. There are no other lords. Every creature in heaven, whether they are angels or the living creatures or the 24 elders, or the saints that have been saved, they all do one thing. They all bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They all worship the living God. They all pay their allegiance to him. They all do his will. And that's why when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, he, he taught it first to his first chosen 12 disciples. And he said, this is how you ought to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. We are supposed to hallow the name of God, sanctify his name through our lives and our behavior and our speech. And then he says, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. We need to know that Jesus is a king. Hallelujah. He's a king, beloved. Yes, the first time he came, he was so humble because he came to save the world. He came to pay the atonement for our sins to die on the cross in other words simply put the first time he came he came humbly he left his glory in heaven he came down as the son of god and the son of man preaching to all humanity especially in judea and israel the word of god and the kingdom of god and and those words are carried in the bible to every race in the world right now right there are, all, there are yes, a, a, a quite a few dialects that do not have the Bible in their language, but, but Bible translators are working on that too. Bible societies, <laughs> different Bible societies are working on that issue as well, so that the Bible will be translated into their languages and they will be able to read the Bible in their own languages. Beloved, that if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, do you understand, do you truly appreciate what this means. If you confess with all your heart that Jesus is the Lord of your life, then he has to rule in your life. He has to be king. And there can, and there can only be a, one king in a kingdom, right? We, are all, uh, uh, we can all agree with that, right? So a kingdom can have only one king. And if you want to be a part of his kingdom because he has a kingdom, it's not this earthly kingdom. It's a heavenly one. Hallelujah. And we on earth are citizens of that kingdom once we accept the king as our lord does it make sense his kingdom is a heavenly kingdom he made it very clear he said 
if my kingdom were of this world, then my disciples would be fighting for me. But it's not of this world. Jesus came to save the lost so that they would once again be initiated into his kingdom. <clears throat> See, humanity, the first human beings, Adam and Eve, were created a part of the kingdom of God. In fact, they were supposed to rule and reign on this world with the authority that God had given him, given them. <clears throat> That's expressed in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, especially 28. Dominion over everything, over the <clears throat> birds of the air, over the animals on the ground, and over the fish in the sea. So God had given uh, Adam and Eve, the first human beings, authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, in the oceans. Okay, the air, the land, and the water. So all the three spheres of earth were given uh, to the human race. But that authority was lost when they obeyed the usurper, serpent, the devil. And they ate of the fruit of, the good of, of, of knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus <clears throat> brought it back through his death on the cross. And by his resurrection on the third day. And if you accept Jesus as your Lord, he will once again initiate you into his kingdom. So the paradise that was lost will be gained again through the blood of Jesus. And that's why, beloved, he is the only way. He is the only legitimate representative of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> All others are imposters. Every other religious leader, every other religion is an imposter religion because Jesus is the only authentic, legitimate son of God who came to the earth in a human form, died on the cross and shed his own blood because his own law requires the shedding of blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it states, for I've given you the blood for the redemption of your souls. And Jesus paid that price on the cross at Calvary when blood was shed from his head by the crown that, that was put in his head, by the nails, the six to seven uh, to eight inches nails that were driven into his hands, and by the nail that was driven into his feet, and his feet were crucified on the cross, nailed to the cross, and he was beaten 39 times with whips, at the edge of which those uh, strips, there would be, <clears throat> there would be these nails. There would be these bones, curved bones, sharpened at the edge, so that they would pierce the flesh once they were whipped. And once these, uh, you know, bones and and uh, nails had gone into the flesh, they would pull them back, and blood would gush out. And the and the seventh place was his ribs where they pierced him with the spear and blood and water came out because the last drop of his blood was poured out on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. That is the price that God had to pay for the redemption of our souls. You are not cheap. Beloved, you are not cheap. God had to give his own son to die that miserable death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And you know why he did that? Because he loves you. Because he, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May God bless the sharing of his word.